Okay, now we'll continue with backtesting and stress testing. You've already seen um, the basic idea behind the backtests of Cupid's and um, Christophers and Pelletier. So let's have a closer look at um, those um, examples and how you do backtesting. So, um, again, um, the reminder um, why we need this. Um, we are using risk models that are trying to um, show reality with a limited amount of information. Um, this always leads to the danger that uh, we're missing out on something, um, that our risk models are not adequate, and that we've chosen, chosen the wrong models. So this leads us to model risk, we've already seen this, and we should check our risk models from time to time to make sure that we are not suffering from risk, model, model risk, sorry. And back tests and stress tests fulfill exactly this purpose. We validate our risk estimations and risk forecasts with the purpose of improving on our models and improving the accuracy of our models. So in this chapter, we will deal with both types of tests and discuss some details of the EU bank stress tests. And actually, uh, there will, is also and will be the next uh, version of the IOPA uh, insurance stress tests and in sample versus out of sample forecasting. So back testing is often understood as the application of historical data to a risk model in order to assess the accuracy of previously estimated risk measures. So from a statistical point of view, backtesting is nothing more than simply quantifying or checking the quality or the fit of a model. And this check can be done in sample or out of sample. And on the following slide, I want to explain to you what I mean with in sample and out of sample. Now, first of all, we have to be careful about the words estimation, forecasting, modeling. What do we mean with estimation and forecasting? Now, when we estimate a model, a statistical model, uh, this is the calibration of the model to the data. And usually this will be the calculation of the model parameters, such as the expected value or the volatility or the kurtosis, so that the model explains the data used for the estimation as accurately as possible. So first example is hypothesis the age of the students in the lecture hall is normally distributed. So what would we do? We collect the data. And if we then calculate the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, we would get 21.4 and 1.28. Then our estimated model, estimated from historical data, is a normal distribution with 21.4 and 1.28 as the estimated parameters. Second example would be a regression line. Um, so, regression, um, let's see, do I get a point here, da, 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 maybe, we have, we have some observations, and we would estimate a regression line, and the regression line would look like this. Then you can see that the parameters, the slope and the intersect of this line would be the estimated parameters of our model, and the model is a linear regression line. That's the second example. Now, under the term forecasting of a statistical model, we understand the projection of the values estimated by the model into the future using previously estimated parameters. So, for example, we would simulate a number from our normal distribution as a forecast of the age of a new student that would enter, uh, who would enter the lecture hall or the Zoom meeting room. The regression line, we can do this actually on this page here, the forecast would actually be, well, here. Let's make this a little bit smaller. And the second forecast would obviously be here. So we would simply forecast our line here into the future. And it could be that the actual next observation is actually here. 
And the next observation is here, but the axes are our forecasts and they're not based on historical data, but these are forecasts from the model that was calibrated to the historical data up to this point here. So this is the available data and this, these are our forecasts. So this is forecasting. Now under the term in sample, we understand the data that is used for estimating the model. If you now take a part of the data, usually this is the most current part of the data, and you keep it back and you're not using it for estimation, but you instead use it to uh, forecast values and to check the validity of your forecast, then this is called out of sample forecasting and out of sample. Um, so let's make an example with our regression line. I have data from, let's say, it starts here at 2000 and it goes on until 2021. Okay, so I have observations. I have to point a lot of points here. So this is our available data, but we now say, well, let's stop here and let's say this is 2018 and we would now say this is in sample and this is out of sample. In other words, we are simply playing dumb and we think, okay, well, it's only 2018. We will now estimate a risk model. Let's use a blue line here. We estimate our model, which would give us this regression. Then, this is our forecast. Let's see if it's, yes, this would be our forecast. And then we can compare the accuracy of, oh, let's use this one, this looks nice. Let's compare our forecast in uh, out of sample by looking at the differences between those actual observations and our forecast. I think I've never done such a nice plot here in this program. I'm quite happy with myself now. And this is done out of sample. Now, is this, can you do this? Obviously, you have the data and um, you are not using all of the data to estimate your model in sample and you're using the most current uh, uh, set of data uh, for out-of-sample forecasting and checking the validity, the forecasting accuracy of your model. Now, what would you expect in sample? The fit in sample needs to be very good. Um, out-of-sample, well, this is the question. Uh, this is actually um, the question whether your um, uh, model risk is high or low. And if you see that your model produces a very good out-of-sample forecasting accuracy, well, you're done. You've back-tested your model. And actually, the yellow line is not really correct. What you would need to check is, obviously, uh, the accuracy of, uh, um, of the regression line based on the blue points. So this would probably be the true forecast here. Um, of the regression line and then you would say well of course here the forecasted uh, regression line and the actual regression line they are almost the same so I'm done. Okay. So this is out of sample forecasting and this is basically what we do in backtesting. Backtesting is the process of evaluating a risk model by applying um, the model to historical data checking for the appropriateness of the model and what we would usually do especially in value of risk back testing is you estimate a parametric value of risk model based on in sample data you predict out of sample 
values as a VAR threshold. And then you would compare the forecasted VAR thresholds and the actual realized losses. That is, if you transform it into ones and zeros, into an indicator variable, you would calculate the number of VAR violations and the sequence of VAR violations. And then you have to perform a statistical test whether the indicator, the sequence of indicator variables, has the desired properties. So check whether um, the quality characteristics of your VAR predictions are really given. More specific, you select a period um, on which the backtesting will be performed. For example, you could say the last 500 trading days. Uh, you compile the relevant historical data, that is all values of the risk positions. Um, you have your data set that is now converted to an in-sample training data set and an out-of-sample test data set. Uh, you can actually see that this is something that is close to a setting we also have in uh, machine learning where you have training data and test data and then the model is checked um, um, it's estimated on the basis of the in sample for example the first 300 of the 500 trading days and then you do the out of sample forecast for every day in the out of sample for days 301 to 500 in the out of sample the forecast values of the model are then compared with actual values of the loss distribution which are known but have not been used in the model calibration for every out of sample day. And ideally, the model should accurately predict each realized out of sample value. And as a perfect prediction, which is obviously not realistic and not expected, the quality of the risk model is assessed on the basis of the size of the VAR violations, for example, or the deviations between the forecasted losses and actual losses. And then if you see some weaknesses, uh, you need to choose a different model, you need to make a better estimation, you need to improve or correct your risk model. Now, this is, of course, in the self-interest of banks and risk managers. If you are a risk manager, you don't want to use a risk model that is inaccurate. However, financial institutions, both banks and insurance companies, they are required by law to regularly check the forecast quality of their risk models. Thus. We have paragraph 318, sentence 1 of the Solvency Regulation, the Solvabilitätsverordnung, that requires banks to, the following, the forecasting quality of a risk model has to be determined using a daily comparison of the potential risk amount calculated on the basis of a holding period of one working day with a change in value of the individual financial instruments or group of financial instruments included in the model calculation. So, back testing is required from the supervisors. So I already mentioned the Cupids and the Krostovas and Pelletier tests. So let's have a closer look at these tests. Now you can consider various aspects um, with VAR models. The most important, one, important ones are the correct number of violations and that they occur independently over time. So losses exceed the VAR threshold much more often than expected. Problem is the risk manager may not have enough reserves and we will go bankrupt. All the losses are always lower than predicted. Problem here is it's way too conservative and this is not desirable because in this case the profit margin of the investor uh, will be lower. The profits of the bank will be lower because you have high capital costs. So if in total there are more VAR violations than expected. The model underestimates extreme losses and we have too high losses than expected. If there are too few violations, the model is considered to be too conservative and therefore unsuitable or too restrictive. Thus, we would check for the requirement that the share of expected violations equals the excess coverage level, alpha, and tests that check this um, coverage level it are called unconditional coverage tests or simply unconditional tests. Unconditional because they only look at the number of our violations or the probability of a violation. This is a very simple one. Uh, let ZT be real random variables and VAR T the value at risk at excess coverage level alpha. Then we define the hit function as the indicator function 1 um, 
with zt small or equal than minus var and this is simply a one if zt is smaller than minus var and it's zero otherwise so a one for a violation and zero otherwise and the hypothesis we need to do a hypothesis testing now the hypothesis that is to be tested for unconditional coverage is simply the expected value of the hit function minus alpha given the information until t minus one should be zero because if you have let's say 100 days and alpha is five percent then obviously we would expect five out of 100 days to have violations so five over 100 is the expectation and if you subtract five percent then this should be zero if the model is correct so this is the very simple hypothesis that you test with tests of unconditional coverage the cupid's test simply sums up the short faults or the hits hd for the n predicted values and it constructs a test statistic km so it's km sum of the hts minus alpha divided by the square root of n the number of days we have for example in this case this would be 100 and then the expected value is approximated by a type of averages of the hits and if you assume the model to be correct then we would have a Bernoulli distributed um, test uh, statistic and we check the um, this uh, hypothesis and the critical values for hypothesis testing are standard normally distributed so we need to find a different estimator, but you can look up the details. The Kubitz test is very simple. You, know? you only check for the correct number of the hike sequences. Now, the next extension is a conditional back test, where we also not only check for the correct number of hits, but also for um, random or independently distributed hits and violations over time. So these are tests of conditional coverage. They jointly check um, for the independence um, and actually this is a conditional test right here yeah. so we have uh, for example the hit sequence HT and they should be independently and identically distributed over time then it is random over time okay now we can have several uh, approaches for conditional coverage back tests uh, they are usually based on the covariance of the violations at different points in time so in other words the old auto covariance function between ht and ht minus j so the hit now and the hit one day ago or two day ago and we need a consistent estimator for the auto covariance function this is simply the sample auto covariance uh, and we can then use this um, test statistic which uses the auto covariance function the squared autocorrelations actually and this is due to Berkowitz, Christofferson and Pelletier in 2008 and we get this test. Similar approach is by Christofferson and Pelletier in 2004. It's based on the intervals between the valued risk hits and then we are checking the Markov property. The probabilities that a one, those are the four probabilities here, the sample probabilities, that after a zero we have a zero after we have a zero we have a one or after one we have a zero or after one we have a one so these are four probabilities you estimate those four probabilities from the sample then you get a matrix and use a likelihood quotient test to check the quality and then you can combine all these four uh, all these two tests actually to have to check for the correct number and the uh, independence over time from these models and to show you how this actually looks like in practice this is taken from the research paper of mine where you see for example a gauge model one percent var and those var exceedances for different models with different parameters you can see here you have some var violations here here and here uh, here here and here and uh, you can do this with a number of models certainly i have done this a lot of times okay 
Next, we have stress testing. Uh, what is stress testing? Um, a stress test is a process in which the effects of extreme or crisis scenarios on individual companies are examined. And it is possible to check the forecasts of a particular risk model as well as the effects on the entire company. And in this process, extreme values are assigned to model parameters or exogenous risk factors. And these extreme values represent worst case scenarios, uh, unfavorable scenarios. Um, and we check how our risk model would look like and what estimates we would in forecast we would get if we are in a very extreme adverse scenario. And the following are some examples of these key metrics. For example, we could look at the effects of those extreme scenarios on our tier one capital ratio, uh, the profitability, the probability of default, uh, likelihood of bankruptcy, etc. Those micro stress tests, they can, very, can be carried out by a company itself and they will be carried out by financial institutions. They will check whether, um, they will check whether um, actually, um, the company, the financial institution, would survive an um, adverse scenario. Now, in the context of regulation, um, this is usually mandated by uh, BaFin, the European Central Bank, um, as a micro-stress test. However, especially the European Central Bank, they also perform so-called macro-stress tests, just like IOPA. Um, so they perform a, a stress test on the whole banking sector, and with this, you check for the resilience of an entire financial system. No? Okay, so this is a very, um, very, very simple example of a micro stress test. This is uh, a made up example. You have a risk management department made a very simplistic assumption for the entire credit risk portfolio, and it looks like as if the expected loss is 1.5 plus 12 times unemployment rate minus 25 point the times the change in GDP. And then you would simply use a scenario where you assume a very unfavorable development of the inflation rate, of unemployment rate, of the change in GDP, and then you check how your credit portfolio would fare. So in this case, you have an expected loss maybe of 4.05 million or 5.8 million. Again, this is a made-up example. Real ones will be much, much more difficult, much more, more complicated. Okay. Last but not least, we have the EU bank stress test. And uh, again, micro stress tests are regularly conducted in various companies. You can do this in any industrial company. The macro stress tests are done by the European system of central banks and the EBA, the European Banking Authority to check the stability of the European banking system. And this is the example of a 2014 EU-wide bank stress test. And the aim of the EU-wide bank stress test is to check the stress on the largest EU banks in case of extreme shocks. An example of such a shock is an economy slump. The aim is to identify weaknesses in the European banking sector at an early stage and to be able to take appropriate countermeasures at the supervisory level. Um, and it included 128 banks. What they did first was the AQR, the Asset Quality Review. So um, they assessed the quality of the assets held by banks. And based on this, the t stress test was then done. The stress test was carried out, EBA, as well as the European Central Bank and national supervisors, and the test was to subject uh, was subject to a uniform methodology across all the European Union, and what they checked is uh, is how the common equity tier CET one capital developed over a period of three years under certain assumptions, and they considered a number of possible risks. And they looked at the risk of credit defaults, significant change in market prices, securitization, country and financing risk, and so on. And then the scenario one was, uh, that was this was the base scenario, um, economy will continue to develop in the same way until 2016 as assumed today. So GDP growth is 1.5, 2 and 1.8 percent. And then they assumed an adverse scenario which was minus 0 0.7, minus 1.5, and just 1.5%. 1 
And obviously, under this scenario, employment will fall sharply by 2016. And this was the adverse scenario. And the um, European Systemic Risk Board developed these indicators uh, for all banks and um, it considered risks um, as the greatest or as risk, uh, the greatest current dangers to the stability of the EU banking sector. And in order to pass the stress test, all banks must obtain at least a CET1 ratio of 5.5% in an adverse scenario. And the more CET1 capital a bank has under difficult circumstances, the more resilient it is in times of crisis. And in the baseline scenario, the target threshold was actually 8%. Okay. And if the stress test revealed that a bank does not meet the equity requirements, the capital requirements, then they had certain deadlines in which they should fulfill, for example, the requirements for assets, uh, the, reach the threshold in the baseline scenario or in the adverse scenario. So there was consequences to those banks that failed the bank stress test. Okay, what were the results? Actually, um, the CT1 ratio decreases in the stress test by 260 basis points to 8.5%. In total, 24 banks fell below the 5.5% threshold meaning a common loss um, in CET1 ratio of 24.6 billion. And the main cause were credit losses and an increase in total risk exposure. And the only German bank that failed the stress test was Münchner Hypothekenbank. No? And you can check up, you can check the results of the stress test in 2014. There were several other ones, of course. Um, I've only given you the example of the 2014 uh, EUI bank stress test, and you can look up the results um, from the internet. In 2016, we had a different one, 53 European banks participated. Uh, you can check the results here, I've given you the link. And uh, they had different risk factors, systemic risk factors, different scenarios, but basically the idea was the same. So, 13 biggest losers, actually, not surprisingly, Monte de Pasqua di Siena, uh, one of the most problematic bank in uh, in Italy uh, for a number of years now um, was one of the losers, if you want to say. They failed the stress test in 2014. And the participating German banks, Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, DZ, LBBW, Bayerische Landesbank, Norddeutsche Landesbank, uh, Landesbank Hessen Thüringen, NRW Bank, Volkswagen, and DK Bank. So those were the German banks that participated in the 2016. EU-wide bank stress test. Okay, so this is back testing and stress testing. And yeah, I'm almost through with today and almost done with the time. So let's stop here for today. And next time we'll continue with the fundamentals of financial derivatives and look at some um, pricing models for financial derivatives, because these will then be used in hedging in risk management. So if you have any questions, stay in the room. Otherwise, thank you for your attention and see you next time. Bye.